Well, hey there, I'm Joshua Johnson. It's very good to be with you on this Monday, March 7th. And here's what we're talking about tonight. Russia is stepping up its attacks on civilian targets inside Ukraine. Meanwhile, another round of negotiations to stop the violence falls short. A member of Ukraine's parliament gives us her thoughts on where things are headed nearly two weeks into this war. The U.S. is moving closer to banning Russian energy imports. Gas prices are, as you know, climbing to near record levels. Now, those two things may seem obviously connected. But why? Where does America's gas come from? And what do these high prices really mean? Then we'll explain something you only see at tax time, a federal fund for presidential campaigns. When you donate on your tax return, where does that money go? And later, the emotional story of a mother in Texas fighting anti-transgender legislation. A state investigation ordered by the governor compares some gender-affirming treatments with child abuse. Russia has been at war against Ukraine for about two weeks now, and the push to save civilians is getting even more urgent. Russia is bombarding key Ukrainian cities, including the capital, Kyiv, the northeastern city of Kharkiv, and the southern port city of Mariupol. What will be done to get everyday people out of danger? That is what leaders from both sides discussed today in Belarus, and there might be some progress in negotiating safe passage for Ukrainians to leave. Attempts to get civilians out over the weekend collapsed. Ukrainian officials accused Russia of intentionally bombing escape routes. Russia also proposed to evacuate hundreds of thousands of people, not toward Western Europe, but into Russia and its close ally, Belarus. Ukraine rejected that proposal. Despite this, the United Nations says more than 1.7 million people have left Ukraine since the war began. Many of those still hoping to leave are sheltering in basements and subway stations. Cities including Kharkiv and Mariupol are worried about a humanitarian catastrophe. Local leaders say that Russia has destroyed critical infrastructure. Many residents are without food, water or power. This humanitarian crisis was the focus of today's UN Security Council meeting. The White House also announced that the U.S. is collecting evidence of possible war crimes and violations of international law. And the U.S. and European leaders are considering more sanctions against Russia, and those might include a ban on oil imports. Let's begin in Lviv tonight with NBC's Cal Perry. And Cal, talk to us a bit more about this ceasefire announcement. What is it about, and is Ukraine on board? Well, so in just the last sort of 12 hours, we're hearing from the Russian Ministry of Defense that at 10 a.m. tomorrow, in many of the major cities that you said, there will be this ceasefire. So it's basically a unilateral ceasefire. What we're hearing from Ukrainian officials is we'll wait and see. Uh, and that's what we've heard from Ukrainian officials throughout this war, and especially in the last sort of 24 to 48 hours, for all the reasons that you laid out. There was supposed to be a set, a dozen or so, of these humanitarian corridors opened up today. The first problem was that 11 of the 12 of them led to Russia. So the Ukrainians, for obvious reasons, were not thrilled about that. One of them actually did sort of function out of the city of Mariupol, but it was for a very short time. Every single one of the other ones came under fire in some way, shape, or form. So it is for that reason that the Ukrainians are going to be very suspicious of any ceasefire announcement by the Russians or of the negotiations for that matter, Joshua. Cal, just a sidebar question. I, I, I wonder what the mood is like where you are, because these feel like a lot of false starts and non-starters, and people on the ground have got to be getting pretty peeved by this point. So the micro mood is very tense because we live in a city that's under curfew where I'm not kidding, we had like a patrol hiding behind that bush there. So that is important to note. I think the citizens of this city are feeling a little unnerved because the security is sort of devolving around them. On top of that, you have the bigger picture, the macro. Um, and there's no question, when you have civilians being targeted as they're leaving these areas, it's the first thing that Ukrainian television shows. Um, so there's an awareness here in Lviv, in the western part of the country, that the situation in the east is, as the mayors of these cities are saying, quote, it is hell on earth. So the, the tone has changed here dramatically. 
quickly, and, and so have the asks. People are no longer complimenting America for uh, the aid, for the sanctions. They're asking, when can we have more? When can we have uh, more support? Because the situation is just so dire on the other side of the country, Joshua. We're going to hear from a Ukrainian MP in just a second, but with regard to that ask, Cal, what's the balance in terms of humanitarian versus military? We've heard consistently, particularly from the U.S. government and other Western governments, that the idea of a stronger military posture, like a no-fly zone that would be enforced by Western military, is kind of a non-starter. Humanitarian assistance sounds like something that can be very much discussed. And just tonight, we heard from the World Bank that they have approved $723 million in total grant and loan financing to Ukraine, mostly for social services, humanitarian aid, and, and so on. But that's not really what Ukraine is asking for primarily right now. Right. Ukraine is asking for more, and specifically the president is asking for this no-fly zone, and his tone has changed. It, it's changed to you, the West, are now responsible for children dying here because uh, there is no no-fly zone. Um, the politics of it are, are easy when it comes to the humanitarian aid, right? It's easy politically across Europe to pledge aid and then move that aid into Ukraine. Um, the harder politics on this one are going to be that military aid. You know, it, look, NATO has said publicly the Secretary General of NATO has said he thinks that he's saving more lives by not directly facing off with Russia, that, that NATO's concern is a World War III breaks out on the continent and more people die because of that. The sort of litmus test on this is these jets from Poland. We heard 48 hours ago the Americans floating the idea basically, look, we'll take the jets that exist in Poland now, we'll somehow move them to Ukraine, and then U.S. will send Poland new jets, replacement jets. And then just in the past couple hours, my colleagues at the Pentagon saying the logistics of that um, are tricky. Well, no kidding, right? It's not just the logistics of it that are tricky, not just how do you actually physically move the planes here, um, but does that give Russia then an opening? Does that give Putin an opening to, to widen this war um, even further? And, and so you have the, these two things pushing against each other. The president of the country saying children are dying because the West is not putting in this no-fly zone, and the West saying more people are going to, going to die uh, if we do. Yeah, I understand Jens Stoltenberg, the Secretary General of NATO, and his point, but I also understand the point of President Zelensky. It will be interesting to see how this balance works itself out. Thank you, Cal. Please do stay yeah. safe. That's NBC's Cal Perry starting us off tonight from Lviv in western Ukraine. Ukraine's president, as Cal mentioned, is continuing to push Western nations to intervene in this war more directly. Yesterday, President Volodymyr Zelensky called for a boycott of Russia's oil. We'll talk more about oil later in the program. Mr. Zelensky also called, as Cal said, for a no-fly zone above Ukraine. That would essentially put planes in the air to possibly confront Russian jets, even, perhaps, to shoot them down. President Biden has been steadfastly against that publicly out of concern for pulling the U.S. directly into this conflict. Joining us now is Kira Rudik. She is a member of the Ukrainian parliament and also a leader of the Holos political party. Ms. Rudik, welcome to the program. Hello, thank you for having me. I want to start with something that you tweeted out. You wrote, I envy hashtag Michelle. She's okay with this new normal thing. She does not wake up hoping this will all go away. I'm assuming Michelle is your cat in the picture there. How is this new normal, as you put it, going for you? How are y'all doing? Um, so my new normal is that I have a team of 30 people who are residing here, like near my house and in my house. Uh, this is the unit that I assembled for the resistance. We start with two hours of training every day where I learn how to uh, ha handle a rifle, how to shoot it, how to uh, fire different kinds of guns. We are exercising, we are running with it. Or the new normal is when you hear siren, you go downstairs and hide under the stairs. Uh, the new normal is that you always have to calculate the amount of food that you have because we are getting ready for a siege and we need to be very cautious about like that we eat and then we buy forward. The new normal is that you have to save gasoline because you never know when you will be able to buy additional ones. The new normal is that every single day you are talking to billions of people all over the world and trying to persuade them to persuade their governments to provide a no-fly zone for Ukraine. New normal is you're waking up 
to uh, uh, to the news if there was any uh, Ukrainian city taken by Russians, and then you thank God that there was none. And it's 12th day right now of new normal. And I'm still, like, I still didn't process it. I still don't believe that this is happening. I still think that, like, hopefully at some point it will go away. We do know that it won't. We do know that what war is right now, but it's still really, really hard to process sometimes. You said that you had been doing weapons training lately. I, I'm, I imagine that you know that, that's one of the scarier parts of your new normal for sure. How likely, just for yourself, how likely do you think it is that the fighting may actually come to you and that you might have to deal with this directly? Well, let's look at the facts. We are fighting against the, uh, one of the third largest armies in the world and definitely one of the most cruel. Their goal is to take the capital where I am residing right now, and uh, they are trying to uh, create a siege for, for the city, and uh, they are definitely will try to get in Russian troops, and we do know what Russian troops do at the cities that they are taking over. So that's why it's uh, very likely that I will have to fire the guns that I'm training with right now. And this is uh, why I stayed, because I want to protect the city. I want to protect my country. It's basically, this is the goal to, at some point, to be able to have a use of every single man and woman who will be giving Putin's uh, army a very good fight. This is what we have been giving uh, him for the last 12 days. I know that there's been work uh, done in terms of creating some kind of a humanitarian corridor, some sort of ceasefire so that people can get out of the major cities and that supplies can get in. Where do you see that the need is the greatest? Just based on where you are, where is the need the greatest? What are some of the greatest needs where you are? Uh, so in Kiev, there has been um, f firing of uh, missiles at the suburbs, and this is uh, uh, where we were just evacuating people by ourselves with our own cars and helping out like them to get to the safety. I will tell you that no humanitarian needs that will be fulfilled right now would not resolve the overall situation. And this is why the, the result and the solution needs to be uh, systematic. We are very good at fighting Putin uh, on the ground. We are, we are good, we know that, we are standing very high. However, you cannot protect yourself and your city and your home from the missiles that are going from the air. And this is why we have been asking for various ways of the no-fly zone or the jets or the Air Force protection, whatever you call it. And this is why there has been some progress on that, because if we get the Air Force protection, if we get a no-fly zone created by different ways, then we do have a chance to to win, and then we wouldn't need any humanitarian um, support, and it wouldn't, we wouldn't need to have refugees. So this is what uh, myself and uh, the whole team is fighting for right now, to uh, get the NATO countries to provide us with necessary jets, with necessary weapons, and uh, help us with the no-fly zone. So there will be no more need for the humanitarian support. I have to let you go in just a moment, but with regards to a no-fly zone, the conversation came up again today. Secretary of State Antony Blinken addressed it. The Pentagon has addressed it a number of times that the concern is that you have to enforce a no-fly zone. And that means that if a Russian jet crosses into that no-fly zone, that someone's got to shoot that jet down or at least engage it in combat. And that raises the possibility that an already bad situation could get even worse by bringing in a much larger war than we're looking at right now. Before I let you go, for those who are concerned about escalation, that this could just snowball if other countries get involved with a no-fly zone and that more people could die as a result, what would you say to them? First of all, Putin has already started the world war because the countries are already involved. They just still have the illusion that they will be able to get away from it. When he is bombarding the nuclear plant in Ukraine, uh, some crazy things and uh, like Chernobyl could happen. And uh, the radiation doesn't ask questions of which passport you are holding. And this is terrible and this is crazy. And this could happen every, any day without uh, asking if the people are NATO members, not NATO members, whatever. When he, when Putin is creating uh, uh, is 
saying that he's going to take Poland, Lithuania, and Lithuania. These are NATO members. They will also face the war. So uh, all the countries that are right now saying, oh, we don't want it to snowball, it already snowballed. This uh, the situation is already on. We are repeating the story of 100 years ago when Hitler was doing exactly the same thing. The world thought that he would be satisfied if give him something, but the tyrants are never satisfied. They only uh, reply good to the one thing, to the force and power. And this is why we are asking, if you don't want to give us the no-fly zone, give us the jets, we will protect us, ourselves. But give them to uh, give them uh, to us fast, because uh, Putin is bombarding the airports, so we wouldn't be able to protect ourselves. So give us something to so Ukraine can protect right now the whole civilized world against the crazy dictator that Putin is, against this war criminal who is shooting women and children and is doing it from the air. And we will fight, and you see us fighting, and we will fight as hell to protect everybody here. Kira Rudik, a member of the Ukrainian parliament, please do stay safe as best you can. I appreciate you making time to talk to us. Thank you very much. Thank you, and glory for Ukraine. A little more detail on the breaking news we just mentioned. The World Bank says that its board has approved $723 million in grant and loan financing to Ukraine. Now, this money comes from a number of different countries, the Netherlands, Sweden, the UK, Latvia, Lithuania, Iceland, in the form of both loans, loan packages, and some loan guarantees. A loan guarantee is basically financial backing in case the party taking out the loan defaults. Japan is also putting up $100 million in what's called parallel financing, which is kind of currency to currency financing. But let me be clear on two things. First of all, Latvia, Lithuania, two of the Baltic states, which are if you go north of Ukraine, you land in Belarus. North of that, you land in Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia. One of Lithuania's leaders expressed concern that if Putin has his way in Ukraine, he won't stop there. He might go for other states along the borders. So that bit of financing is significant. Also, according to the World Bank statement, this is not military financing. This, according to the World Bank, is to fund things like critical services, like paying hospital workers, pensions for senior citizens, social programs for vulnerable populations. So this is not funding to necessarily help the fight on the ground in Ukraine, but to help the Ukrainian people survive. And it's designed to be fast moving money that the World Bank can just send to Ukraine quickly. That's World Bank funding. That's $723 million in grants and loans to Ukraine. And based on what's happening on the ground, it's easy to see why that money is necessary. Because as we've been reporting, Russian soldiers are continuing to escalate their attacks against Ukrainian civilians. Now, the United Nations says it's recorded more than 400 civilian deaths as of yesterday that we know of. And that count includes at least 27 children. Nearly 2 million Ukrainians have managed to flee the country, but among those who could not or would not leave, casualties are rising. From our partners at Sky News, Alex Crawford reports from a city just south of Kyiv. They know all about civilians being attacked here. This small village community just south of the Ukrainian capital has been torn apart by Russian bombs. Almost an entire street disappeared in an instant. Three children and three adults were killed, devastating their families and the whole neighborhood. The explosions have left a deep burning anger and a thirst for revenge amongst the men of the village who've taken up arms to defend their community and their country. I feel only hate, he tells us. We'll never, ever forgive them for this. Another says they have to close the skies. The rest of the world have to become involved and close the airspace above Ukraine. And their friend says we'll keep on shooting them. Every time they shoot us, we'll shoot back and we won't leave any alive. We're going to kill every single invader. Those who survived the explosions are still sifting through what's left of their lives to piece together precious possessions or memories. 
Oksana tells us how scared they all are. We can't sleep at night, she says. Whenever they hear sounds, they think it's another bombing, and they run out of the house. Her husband says the war has completely upended their lives and left them terrified. We've no idea what's going to happen, he says, when it's going to happen or where. They're still reeling from the shock of it all, and I think it follows a pattern of an increasing number of civilians and civilian targets or civilian locations which appear to be um, targeted or certainly not um, off the agenda of the, the, the Russian war machine. Civilians are in the crosshairs of this war. A brief respite in shelling and firing in Irpin on the outskirts of the capital meant those still trapped were finally able to escape. <laughs> Remember, none of these people can be certain they won't be fired on again. And they know their neighbors who fled earlier were attacked. Ukraine! Ukraine's former president Petro Poroshenko has been busy rallying volunteer fighters and soldiers. He's among a growing list of people demanding safe passage for civilians. We were with him as he boosted morale and championed the bravery of the troops. Their job protecting the critically important southern route out of the capital is crucial. And he brought fresh weapons and supplies to help. If this route is taken by the Russian military, the capital will be encircled. If Ukrainians could win on defiance and courage, they would win. But they need more than defiance and courage, don't they? And at the uh, moment, the capital is slowly first being of all, encircled. First of all, remove the word if. We definitely win. This is first message. We, we, we will win with or without Western assistance because you see how strong is Ukrainian, but uh, it takes significantly more time and will need significantly more lives and blood. Mm. And this is just uh, the decision from our partners in the West. Do you ready to give us the weapons? Do you ready to increase the sanction? Do you ready to do all of this to minimize Ukrainian blood? and Ukrainian lives. Please do that immediately. The former president took us to see another residential area which had been hit. Ukraine's heading for many more civilian deaths, he's warning. And there are few in the country confident enough to say otherwise right now. Alex Crawford, Sky News in Vassal Kiev. Hey, make a reminder, if you would, to stay with us tomorrow night after this program. NBC's Lester Holt will anchor a one-hour special report. Inside Ukraine is tomorrow night at 9 Eastern after now tonight here on NBC News Now. Coming up, gas prices. Why are they rising and when will they go down? The answer involves how we get our gasoline. A primer on what you pay at the pump is just ahead. Stay close. If we told you before this war that supporting Ukraine would mean higher gas prices, how would that affect your solidarity? Prices at the pump are giving many Americans a lot to think about. AAA says the national average is above $4 a gallon. Some states are paying much more, including some record highs. New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and especially California all broke records over the weekend. We heard from a lot of you about dealing with these rising prices. Daniel says that he is going to Costco or using his discounts with Kroger. Freedom tweeted, we schedule carpooled grocery shopping trips with others. Very smart. Ziggy tweeted, doing without extras, staying home, you know, same as it has been since early days of COVID. And Morton tweeted, I drive my Prius and live my life. Plenty of Prius drivers in Southern California and that is where NBC Business and Tech correspondent Jolene Kent spoke to drivers in Los Angeles paying startlingly high prices for gas. Sticker shock is real. You kind of have to see it to believe it. $7 a gallon for regular out here, even more for premium. The national average, $4.07. And the 
For the biggest record is actually $4.11, and experts anticipate U.S. prices to hit that later today or tomorrow morning. And what's really hurting for so many people is inflation, very much outpacing wage growth by about 2 percent. So many people having to make adjustments to their budgets as this war intensifies. Several of the drivers I've been talking to today, though, say they're willing to pay more if it means supporting the Ukrainian cause. But of course, it still doesn't take away from the fact that this is a very expensive situation for budgets. It's kind of crazy, you know what I'm saying? Because it's like it's like uh, gas. I mean, gas prices now. I mean, like what you're spending gas now is like kind of like a whole electric bill, a whole gas bill. So it's kind of like now, like before, I wasn't actually like putting to uh, gas in like too much, like with my uh, expenses. Uh, but as of right now, it's kind of like kind of hurting me. Our adjustment is paying more for gas, and there's a lot of people out there going through much worse. So, I mean, it's a small price to pay compared to what's happening globally. Looking ahead, Gas Buddy says prices are expected to rise another 40 to 50 cents, perhaps, in the coming days and weeks. That was NBC's Jolene Kent reporting from Los Angeles. So how does the war in Ukraine affect all this? And how does the price of oil in Russia shape the price of gas in America? Let's continue now with Dan Dicker. He's an expert in energy markets and an author and the author of Turning Oil Green. Mr. Dicker, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thanks, Josh. So what does Russian oil have to do with our gas prices? Can you give us the most basic definition or explanation, especially since, according to the Energy Information Administration, the U.S. only gets about 8 percent of its oil from Russia and Russian sources. So what do these two things have to do with each other? Right. And maybe even less than 8 percent. I'd argue with that figure. I think it's even less. But uh, as simply as I can put it, oil is a global commodity. So no matter where something happened that affects either the demand or supply of oil, whether it's here in the United States or in Iran or in Saudi Arabia or in Ukraine or in Russia, uh, the prices get reflected all over the world. So no one is uh, you know, unaffected by whatever happens in the global oil market, unfortunately. Now, people like me try to tune into CNBC when things like this happen and look at the price of like Brent crude and WTI crude and go, oh yeah, crude oil, yeah, it's, it's more expensive now. That's, that's the whole, I don't know what I'm looking at. What should we be looking at for those of us who are novices, who just don't understand the system, to know that we're looking at the right indicator? It, it seems like some of this is driven by the actual supply chain of how gas actually gets to the pump and some of this is just driven by the same emotions that drive Wall Street on a day-to-day -day basis. What should we be paying attention to? Yeah, and, and, and you just uh, asked me to uh, summarize the last three books that I wrote, so I don't know if I can do that. <laughs> I'll give it, you got four I'll minutes, a, go. Okay, I'll give it a college try. And you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, as of right now, there really is no supply shortage in the United States. So fundamentally speaking, there's no reason for gas prices to be getting higher every day. But of course, what drives prices are the markets and what investors and people who are planning for the future and everybody who engages in those markets do to those markets. So there is obviously a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of um, the speculation going on in some cases. And there are a lot of commercials who are wondering themselves what they're going to have to pay for a gallon of gas or a gallon of jet fuel or a gallon of heating oil three or six or seven months down the road. And all of that drives prices higher. So there's emotion, there's fundamentals as well. And I would say that right now, what we're seeing in gas prices is about 60% fundamentally driven because oil prices were already on their way up before even this broke out in the Ukraine. Um, and another, I guess the other 40 percent is exactly that, fear and emotions and um, part of the anxiety that's going into the oil markets right now. Could you explain something else that I saw as I was, again, trying to decipher CNBC, because I'm not an expert. But one of the things that one of our correspondents mentioned was something I believe called backwardation, where the immediate prices for oil went up. But further out, when you looked, they kind of came back down somewhat. What is your sense of whether or not savvy traders believe that this increase is here to stay, as opposed to whether this is something that may kind of even itself out or reduce over time? 
Well, I, I, you know, I, I appreciate you looking into this, Josh. This is very deep in the weeds, and I don't know how far again you want me to go into this stuff, but I would say this. I would say that what you're talking about is you're talking about what we call the curve of prices and what happens to futures markets as you go further out in time. And as you know, um, what happens in markets very much that are bullish, that markets that have gone up a lot and gone up a lot quickly, is that in general, the differential between prices you see now and prices you see, like you say, backward dated, further out on the curve are much, much, much lower. Now, what you're really asking me is whether that kind of backwardation, in other words, the prices being lower six months from now, at least in the futures market, would indicate that prices will be lower six months from now in the future. And I would tell you that in general, um, in my 35 years of dealing with oil markets, the curve of prices has been a lousy predictor of where prices will be in six months. So just because prices that you see further out on the curve are lower does not necessarily mean we're in for some relief anytime soon, unfortunately. You made a point on Twitter today that the goal is not really to stop these sales, but to discount them. And apparently we're already seeing some of that happen. Bloomberg's reporting that Russian oil is being offered, at least in some places, at a steep discount just at the prospect of bans on crude oil. What kind of impact do you think that would have? Granted, as we said, America's exposure to Russian crude oil is 8% or lower, depending on your estimate. Depending on where you are in the world, if you're in parts of Western Europe, they're much closer to Russia. They might depend on Russian oil supplies much more. How much do you think that these restrictions or bans might actually affect prices? Um, it's more important not how they impact prices. It's more important how um, effective they can be as sanction tools and uh, really hitting the Russian economy where it hurts. Uh, Russia is very much a petrostate. It depends so much on revenues it gets from oil and gas. And these bans, which forces, doesn't really stop the, mar the, uh, the Russians from selling market from oil, but it does force them into secondary kind of dark pool markets. And that can have a major impact on the cash flows that Russia gets from their sales of oil and gas. Uh, in some ways, you know, I think that the, the bravery of the Biden administration to take this on is quite, uh, quite remarkable. They know that um, these bans or talks of bans will have an enormous impact on gas prices. And they have already had an impact on gas prices. And normally, you know, rising gas prices are, you know, are a political nightmare for right. an administration. So for them to take this on, they, they really have done something uh, quite astonishing. They are willing to do a little bit of political suicide here in order to stand up to Putin and the authoritarianism he represents. So to me, as a, as, a, as a market guy who's been watching oil markets for a long time, this is really the first time in my lifetime that I have seen not only um, politics take a second, a back seat um, here in the oil markets, but as, you know, with oil companies too, we've seen you know, uh, also remarkable actions, BP, Shell, Exxon, right, right, right. Right. all disappeared from their Russian investments without any hopes of getting any of that money back. They might, or they might not. I, in many ways, I'm very heartened, you know, in my industry to see this kind of reaction, correct reaction, taking politics and money and putting it on a back burner for a little while in order yeah. to support Europe and the Ukrainians. Dan Dicker, author of Turning Oil Green. I appreciate the explanation, sir. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Josh. We would love to hear more of your stories about dealing with rising gas prices. We are at NBC Now tonight on Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. You can always leave us a voicemail, 888-575-2NBC. That's 888-575-2622. Or email us, now tonight at NBCNews.com. We will get to some of the day's other headlines next, including where some of us will vote this November. Redistricting battles in North Carolina and Pennsylvania are heating up. We'll have the latest from the U.S. Supreme Court. Plus, an explainer on something you may have noticed at tax time. It's an option on your return to help pay for presidential campaigns. Where's all that money going? We'll explain when we come back.
this November, you could be voting for members of Congress differently, thanks to redistricting. Today, the U.S. Supreme Court declined to intervene in two separate redistricting disputes. The Republican-led legislatures in Pennsylvania and North Carolina wanted to block new congressional maps that were approved by their courts. Supreme Court justices rejected the cases not because they were necessarily without merit. Apparently, the court simply considered now to be a bad time. Justice Kavanaugh wrote, quote, It is too late for the federal courts to order that the district lines should be changed for the 2022 primary and general elections, unquote. Justices Thomas, Alito, and Gorsuch argue that the court should have taken up North Carolina's appeal. Justice Alito wrote on their behalf that the North Carolina case, quote, presents an exceptionally important and recurring question of constitutional law, namely the extent of a state court's authority to reject rules adopted by a state legislature for use in conducting federal elections. There can be no doubt that this question is of great national importance, unquote. Now, this all matters because depending on who you ask, the midterms in Pennsylvania and North Carolina could be more favorable to Democrats. We will see whether they can keep control of Congress or whether Republicans will take over. Did you file your income taxes yet? If so, you might have noticed a box on your federal form. It offers a chance to give to a fund for presidential campaigns. But candidates have been avoiding this rich fund, probably because it comes with strings attached. Income tax forms have a section offering to contribute $3 to the presidential election campaign fund. This fund holds more than $400 million. But last year, less than 4% of taxpayers checked this box to donate. What exactly are they donating to? The presidential election campaign fund was a part of a broader reform uh, of campaign finance law that emerged out of Watergate. Congress had, in 1974, enacted a reform that made public money, or tax funds, available to candidates who were running for the presidency. But basically, the idea is that it would be easier or for candidates to run without relying on private contributions. In primary elections, presidential candidates can receive matching payments from the federal government. A candidate has to raise more than $5,000 in at least 20 states. Up to $250 of each donation counts toward this goal, even if a donor gives more. And campaigns must limit their spending in each state. Unlike the matching funds for the primaries, the general election has grants available. Candidates got well over $103 million in 2020. Candidates who accept these funds may not raise private contributions from individuals or PACs with certain exceptions. When the fund was created, taxpayers and presidential candidates supported it. When the question first appeared in 1976, more than a quarter of taxpayers checked the box. Until 2004, participation was almost universal. Yeah, almost every candidate who ran, Republicans, Democrats, they accepted the public money. It was noteworthy when the candidate said, I'm not taking any government money. That's because not accepting public money lets candidates spend what they want. George W. Bush chose not to take the money in the 2000 Republican primary. In 2008, Barack Obama passed up those funds as well. Public financing of presidential elections as it exists today is broken and we face opponents who become masters at gaming this broken system. And presidential campaigns are only getting pricier. 2020 was the most expensive election in history. Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, these these are candidates and they all spent hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, and so if I'm Joe Biden, if I want to be competitive, I have to at least m try to come close to matching that. Otherwise, I'm just going to be overwhelmed. In 2020, Senator Bernie Sanders ran for president without huge donors. When Bernie Sanders staked out this position that I'm going to be a 100% grassroots funded campaign, people laughed it off. But then he showed that you know, millions and millions and millions of people and millions and millions and millions of dollars were able to flow into the campaign to sustain him. It's not just presidential races that have gotten expensive. Congressional campaigns are, too. Many Americans say they are against these pricey campaigns. Back in 2018, Pew Research found that most Americans support campaign spending limits. If that's the case, 
it might be too late for this fund to help. The candidates who are have a real shot at winning, they're going to spend 5, 10, 15, 20 times. And it's not that difficult to raise that money, uh, especially now with uh, online uh, fundraising. As for limiting campaign spending, the Supreme Court has already weighed in. The, the Supreme Court has been quite clear for 50 years, almost 60 years, that you cannot put limits on how much people raise and spend uh, on campaigns, um, with the sole exception of public funding. In the past, some lawmakers have pushed to reallocate the funds to pay down the federal deficit or to fund cancer research. In the meantime, the fund sits with hundreds of millions of dollars waiting to be used. And you can still contribute on your tax forms, at least for now. Up next, a mother in Texas shares her emotional story of raising a transgender child. Some families are worried about the state accusing them of abuse. The governor's directive and her response before we go. LGBTQ children are the targets of more state laws these days. A bill in Florida that's gotten a lot of attention is moving closer to becoming law. Tomorrow, the Florida State Senate plans to vote on the Parental Rights in Education Bill. Critics are calling it the Don't Say Gay Bill. This measure would restrict classroom, classroom discussions about sexual orientation and gender identity. Florida's Governor Ron DeSantis has said he supports the bill. Meanwhile, transgender women and girls continue to be targeted by bills about sports. Utah's Governor Spencer Cox says he plans to veto a measure banning trans athletes from girls' sports. The Utah State Legislature passed this bill on Friday. The governor says he wants trans athletes to know, quote, that it's going to be okay, we're going to work through this, unquote. A similar bill just became law in Iowa. On Thursday, Governor Kim Reynolds signed a ban to keep trans women and girls out of female sports teams. Iowa's law applies to public and private K-12 through schools as well as colleges. Women deserve the same opportunity as men to develop their talents and strive for excellence. The principle of equality, equal opportunity justifies virtually all the progress women have made over the centuries. Iowa is now one of 11 states with a law like this on the books. Temporary injunctions are blocking Idaho and West Virginia from enforcing their laws. One of the most contentious measures is in Texas, involving health care. At issue is gender-affirming care provided to transgender children. Governor Greg Abbott issued a directive to conduct child abuse investigations into this care and the parents who seek it for their children. Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton backed up the governor's order, and the state's Department of Family and Protective Services has begun investigations. On Wednesday, a judge halted one investigation involving a family with a 16-year-old trans daughter. The ACLU and Lambda Legal sued the state on the teen's behalf. Texas is appealing the decision in hopes of overturning a temporary restraining order. NBC News has reached out to Governor Abbott's office for comment. We have yet to hear a response, but that offer stands. In the meantime, let's hear from someone directly affected by this, someone who's been fighting to protect her child for a long time. Rachel is the mother of a transgender child in Texas. We are using her first name only to help protect her family's identity. Also with us is Derek Mergel Rust, an attorney representing the parents of trans youth across Texas. He's also an adjunct professor at the Texas Tech School of Law. Good to have you both with us. And Rachel, I wonder if I might start by asking you to tell us about your little one. If we got to know them beyond this controversy that has kind of affected you and your family, what will we notice about them that we might notice about any kid? Well, you would notice I have three thriving children. Um, you know, the issues we're facing right now are not things that we have to deal with on a regular basis. Um, my daughter is, uh, she loves riding her bike. She loves swimming. She loves hanging out with her friends, playing Pokemon Go. Um, all the things that you would expect from a 12-year-old uh, who's happy, and, um, you know, you'll have to forgive me, uh, because it's pretty hard for me to talk about this without tearing up because it's just been such an awful couple of weeks. I can imagine. I can imagine. And in many ways, she's just like 
every other little girl. By the way, you mentioned she's a, a Pokemon Go fan. Has she nagged you about Pokemon Scarlet and Violet and Arceus? Has that conversation come up in the house yet? I mean, I block it all out. I'm like, yeah, that's just a <laughs> language to me, so you do you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hear that. I hear that. I have a, a Pokemon fan in my house, so I can, I can relate to that. Tell me, Rachel, about your journey as the parent of a transgender child. What was that learning curve like for you when you had to start engaging with all of this? It's been so long at this point. Um, I mean, there was never a time that my daughter didn't identify as a girl. It was really more of uh, my husband and I coming to terms with it. And it it was a really difficult struggle for my husband in particular. Um, but we've been fighting anti-transgender legislation for over five years now. And... Um, it's been uh, quite a beatdown overall because, like I mentioned before, we don't have to deal with these things on a daily basis. Libby knows who she is, and um, we have come to love and appreciate her exactly um, as she as she is, living her authentic life. And, um, you know, I, I think it can be hard for families to understand that haven't been through this. And that's why we did seek support and, um, you know, mental health care providers, physicians, uh, we've, we've been through a lot, making sure that we are a few steps ahead, making sure that the people in her life are supportive, that she isn't experiencing discrimination. And, uh, and we've been really successful. The people in her life know who she is and they want to support her. Before I come to your attorney, it sounds, Rachel, like a lot of the journey has been yours, that she has been kind of living her life and being who she is, and it's sort of the adults around her who've had to go on this journey. They're the ones who've had the learning curve. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what it is. Um, it's uh, so much of unpacking my own expectation of the child I thought I would have and learning to appreciate the child that I do have. Derek Mogul Russ, let me ask you about this directive from the governor. I read Governor Abbott's directive, including the response from the Attorney General Ken Paxton, which was written to Matt Krause, who's a member of the Texas House of Representatives. A lot of what's written in this has to do with a number of surgical procedures that some people who are transgender choose to employ. A lot of the concern, at least the way that the attorney general wrote it, has to do with what he described as elective procedures that, quote, infringe upon a minor child's constitutional right to procreate. So a lot of this seems like it's focused more on medical surgical procedures as opposed to just affirming who children are. How do you see this legal fight? So I think that the most important thing when we're looking at what the attorney general wrote is, is exactly what you're focusing on, which is their fo the, the attorney general is focused on the standards of care being around surgery and, and the standards of care, especially for minors, are traditionally not surgical. In fact, most of the standards of care talk about social transitioning or just dressing or, or appearing as their gender identity. Um, when you're younger, there may be some puberty blockers that might be prescribed as a, from a physician, and then maybe hormone therapy for teenagers as they get a little bit uh, further along into the puberty process. And I think what when we're looking at hormone therapy, it's, it's important to recognize that it is reversible uh, mostly, and it is always prescribed by a doctor. So a teenager going on hormone therapy is not something that one just haphazardly chooses. Uh, you must know that the White House has spoken out about this. The president put out a statement on Texas's actions regarding transgender youth. Among other things, the statement reads, quote, affirming a transgender child's identity is one of the best things a parent, teacher, or doctor can do to help keep children from harm, and parents who love and affirm their children should be applauded and supported, not threatened, investigated, or stigmatized, unquote. Uh, Mr. Mergle Rust, what, what is your concern, the legal concern behind all of this for your client? I mean, are we talking about something involving your client's parental rights or like what's the what's the threat here so there's two 
things that are really at play. The first major thing that I don't think a lot of people understand is that when CPS comes to investigate in Texas, when they uh, complete their investigation, which usually cannot last any longer than 30 days, if CPS finds that a parent has reasonably engaged or they have reason to believe that a parent has engaged in child abuse, prior to any court intervention whatsoever, parents go on a child abuse registry that can be accessed not only within Texas, but by other states as well and by organizations such as schools. And so if parents are being placed on that registry inappropriately prior to the court getting involved, there's significant concern, especially if CPS is following the direction of the governor, which his, his directive is not based in law. Uh, from the children's or from the child's perspective, Texas law is written around the best interest of the child. And I know when a child is not in an affirming home or environment, a transgender child has almost a one in two um, chance of attempting to commit suicide. And when they are in an affirming home, that uh, attempted suicide rate drops down to their cisgender peers at about six and a half percent. So it's a huge, huge uh, uh, situation in their life that we need to we need to keep that in mind as well. Rachel, I wonder what you would say to parents who might suggest, you know, nothing against your daughter. We want your daughter to be happy and healthy. But maybe this is a journey that she should make on her own. And when she's an adult, she can decide what she does with her body, as opposed to you as a parent making decisions that she may grow up to regret or rethink. What would you say to them? Well, these are her decisions. We're, we're supporting and affirming her decisions. These are not things that we are deciding for her. Um, I think a parent that uh, would say something like that truly doesn't understand what we're going through, what any transgender person is going through. And I, I can't possibly understand it as a cisgender parent, um, but I know that this is what my daughter, uh, I know that my daughter needs support. I know that all transgender youth need support. And that's why we have experts. That's why we have people who specialize in care for transgender youth. That's why we rely on people who do this for a living and have um, significant expertise. Because uh, <laughs> I can say that certainly um, I don't expect the governor to weigh in on any of my health care options. And um, I don't expect him to be weighing in on the health care that my daughter needs, that transgender youth need, when he has absolutely no experience, no expertise, and is going against the recommended care of every single major health care organization. And before I have to let you go, Rachel, for parents who may be in a similar situation to you, who are struggling to deal with this in their own ways, what would you say to them? Is there any advice you would give them as they kind of begin this journey with their children? Um, I mean, I would just tell parents you're not alone. It can feel really lonely if you don't know other transgender individuals. So many people know trans kids and know trans adults, but they don't know that they know them. And uh, so it can feel really lonely when you start on this journey and you don't know other people going through this. But um, just know you're not alone. There's resources out there for you. And um, we're all in this together. I, I know I'm out of time, but Rachel, one last thing I have to ask you. Forgive me for going over time. How are you doing? Are you going to be okay? I just see the weight of this. It's like you're, I see it all over you and I get it. I, I totally understand why this is heavy, but like, are you optimistic for the future of how this is going to go? This feels like such a heavy weight on your shoulders right now. I don't, I'm not sure I know how to answer that question. Um, there are families across the state who are fighting all the time, all, all kinds of battles to make sure that their children are safe. And my family included has been fighting hard to make sure that our kids stay safe, all three of my kids. And now we are facing the weight of the government trying to strip our children from loving homes, not only uh, families like mine, but families who have less access to resources. And there are children out there who desperately need help, who are being abused. And this kind of political theater is going to stop those children from getting help 
and uh, the support that they need because our governor is using our children as political pawns instead of letting them live the life that they need to. Rachel and attorney Derek Mergel Rust, I know that this is gutting to have to talk about so much. I really appreciate your willingness to speak up. Again, we've offered Governor Abbott an opportunity to speak about this. If he does, we will certainly welcome him. But for now, we appreciate the two of you making time. Thank you both very much. Thank you for having us. Thank you. And thank you for making time for us. Do send us your stories of dealing with gas prices at NBC Now Tonight on social media. Leave us a voicemail or email us now tonight at NBCNews.com. Until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. We'll see you tomorrow. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.